Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. As we study the life of Jesus, we have been studying his life and now we're about two and a half years into his ministry. Uh, about another year to go before he is crucified. And he has been meeting all kinds of opposition. And he's been down uh, in Galilee, and he decides that it's time to leave, take his disciples with him, and spend some special time with them in educating them for the next few months. And so he heads way north, up to Tyre and Sidon, over on the coast, now that's country where uh, the Israelites were supposed to have uh, thrown out and killed and destroyed all the Canaanites. But our story this time is evidence that that didn't happen. And we're going to be in Matthew 15 and starting with verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed unto the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her, Not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, Am I not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. What a privilege that Canaanite woman had. Yes. And the question we want to ask ourselves, since we're trying to stand back and take the big picture here, is what is Jesus doing way over by Tyre and Sidon? I mean, like you mentioned, this is a Canaanite woman. Uh, if Joshua and the Israelites had followed directions from back in those days, she wouldn't even be here. But Jesus is out there, and interestingly enough, Ellen White suggests that he went all the way out to that specific spot just for her. And there are lots of questions you could ask. How did this lady know <coughs> that Jesus could heal her daughter? How she did recognize him. Yeah, how did she recognize him? It was not like he was pictures in the paper or something. <laughs> you know, there was nothing like that. So how did she know? Word got around. Word got around, but word got around of what? Did they, did word get around that he was headed for their in their direction? Oh, did see, he? This is about a year before uh, <coughs> he was crucified. One year before so he was crucified. He had about two years maybe. And when you, what he was doing was probably so far out of the ordinary that uh, the word. <laughs> well, and, and back when we were talking about his ministry in Galilee, he said by the time he started really healing people, people were flocking from Tyre and Sidon and the Decapolis. And so people had come from all the areas around to him to be healed. So it's not surprising that, that she would have heard about him. But how did she know he was coming to Tyre and Sidon? How did she know how to find him? How did she know to recognize him when he did show up? And, or did Jesus specifically take his disciples right to where she was? Well, that, I mean, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that he didn't just 
go from here down to there and did nothing in between. Yeah. Um, the the Bible may be a little dark on in in the details, but mm -hmm. certainly. I would assume that he was doing things along the, along the way. How many miles is it from Capernaum to <coughs> Tyre and Sidon? Well, I haven't measured it off. Probably, uh, it's probably 70 miles, 60 or 70 miles, something like that. Can you imagine Jesus going anywhere for 70 miles and not running into somebody that wants something done? Yeah. Didn't Jesus have a whole entourage with him? <coughs> Not just the 12 disciples, but the women and so well, on. Well, we have evidence of that elsewhere, yeah. later. It, it happened during his time of his Galilean ministry, and apparently happened later in his Samaritan, uh, Samaria, Perean ministry. But at this time, it seems like he was primarily with the 12. And the, these long, he's going to make two long journeys up into the North Territory. Did they, did they always walk? Or didn't they have? No, they Except walked. Donkeys? Or they walked. Something. They so, walked. So what's the, what was the purpose, I mean, what's the point of your point? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just trying to, trying to figure out, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help us to think the context in which this happened, the kind of situation it was at that point in time, you know, how did, there was no communication of any, no, no, no electronic communication for sure, there was no you know, mail or anything else like this. I mean, how did this woman know that Jesus was coming? How did she know how to find him? Uh, and uh, I can tell you that Ellen White suggests that he went there specifically to help her. Okay. Why? I mean, yeah. he, he went there to help her, but what was he trying to teach exactly anybody else uh, that exactly. heard about this? And, and then why did he appear to play so coy with yeah. her? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With her. And I think. Questions. I, there's a couple answers that we need to give to that. First of all, he, he treated her the way that a Jew would normally, uh, an ordinary Jew would normally treat people, uh, Gentiles and especially Canaanites and so forth like that. So she came expecting that. She, she probably expected that, yeah. And Jesus did that at first, uh, and, and Desire of Ages supports this. Jesus did that at first so that the disciples could sort of see, could sort of see well, this is the way you know, a Jew would act. Right. And then when he responds to her and heals her, to her daughter, uh, they saw how Jesus would like to respond. And the fact that Jesus would make that long journey up there just for the benefit of this woman's daughter primarily, um, I think told them a a great deal, and we're going to find out. He's spending six months, basically, in these Gentile territories, this next six months, Gentile territories, as far as he can go away from, from Jewish territory. But there must have been hundreds of people that were as sick as that daughter was, or as uh, demon-possessed as she was. He must have had a reason for going up for that one. Yeah. But wasn't that also... Couldn't you say that was a test of her faith, a practical test? Yes. Because she met him word for word. She yes. came back right at him. Exactly. Yeah. You know, was this to teach the woman something, or was it to teach the disciples something and us both. something? It and, was. And the apostles after, after the resurrection. We're going to see in this next six months that Jesus goes out of his way on several occasions to do something remarkable, miraculous things to try to help his disciples see that Gentiles are no different than Jews. And this, I think, is the beginning of that. But one question I got is, does Jesus do anything randomly? Probably. I mean, can't you say, after everything's said and done, that every move he made was planned by him? That, that Not planned by him, planned by his father. father. Yeah. Well, to me, that's... <laughs> he, got, he got that instruction day by day from yeah. his father. Okay, but then it was planned. It was planned. It was yeah. planned, and, and everything else was planned. Every healing was planned. Everything, wherever he went, yeah. was planned. You can look at it that way. He, That's right. So we're trying to find out what, what was the message in that plan. There, there may also have been um, a, simpler, a similar phenomena here uh, as as it was with the lady at the well, the woman mm -hmm. at the well, yeah. in that when he left, um, word got out of what he had done here, yeah. and 
And on my little map here, it's way, way down here at the corner, but it would be reasonable to assume that word got out about this, about this, this yeah. man uh, down in here in these. Yeah, except areas. that I have to warn you, that map, which I, I got the best map I could find, but your map is upside down. He's actually going north and not south. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's way over here. <laughs> From where right, exactly. native territory. No, that, that's absolutely correct. Um, and, and we need, uh, I mean, as several of you have already suggested, there were a lot of other people who were sick and whatever. I don't think there was any question about the fact that he went there. And one explanation would be the woman's faith. Yeah. Yeah. This woman believed absolutely that Jesus could heal her daughter. So did he go there? because his faith, her faith, uh, commanded that he come, in a sense. In a sense. That there, there, there was part of teaching that he went there, but, but she was there, she had this faith, mm -hmm. and, and it was just within his nature that he had to go there. Yeah. Do you think that maybe, like you suggested, that she became a missionary in that area? Yeah. And more people from that area would go then to Jerusalem at Passover time in order to see him and be taught with him there again because they'd yeah. know that that's where he was going. Yeah. Which, by the way, reminds me that um, we have these handouts that we spend a lot of time preparing. If you're interested in looking at the life of Christ in a chronological fashion, um, these handouts will be available on our website, which is at theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you can follow along there with us if you would like. So what happened next? Well, we go next following chronologically now. Now, we're not, we're not going Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're jumping around, but we're following chronologically to Mark 7, verse 31. And it, clearly identifies itself here because it says Jesus then left the territory of neighborhood of Tyre and went on through Sidon to Lake Galilee going by way of the territory of the ten towns. Now for those of you who are familiar and I'm going to I'm going to try to cheat here just a little bit and hold this up. I don't know whether we can get our cameras focused on this but actually I need to turn it around this way. Um, this if you go north south this is the sea of uh, the the Mediterranean Sea Sea of Galilee is down here. Jesus has traveled way up here to Sidon, Tyre, and then he went on further up here, way up here to Sidon, and then went on his way back, and, and obviously he's taking his time here. He's not, he's not in a rush. He, he's going to take six months to, to just be with his disciples. They travel down here. Instead of going straight to Galilee, they go out here and they cross, staying in Gentile territory, they go way out over here and down through the Decapolis, and finally they're going to come and we'll talk about what happens when they get back down here. But he's basically staying out of Jewish territory and traveling in Gentile territory in order to spend special time with his disciples. So here we have this story, Mark 7, starting from verse 31. Some people brought him a man who was deaf and couldn't hardly speak, and they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. Now, what kind of territory are we talking about now? Gentile. Gentile. We're talking about Gentile territory, okay? So Jesus took him off alone, away from the crowd, put his fingers in the man's ears, spat, and by the way, you, you talked about whether other people were traveling with him. Here he is with a crowd already. Uh, put his finger, fingers in the man's ears, spat, and touched the man's tongue. Then Jesus looked up to heaven, gave a deep groan, and said to the man, Ephatha, which means open up. At once the man was able to hear, his speech impediment was removed, and began to talk without any trouble. Then Jesus ordered the people not to speak of it to anyone, but the more he ordered them not to, the more they told it. And all who heard were completely amazed how well he does everything, they exclaimed. He even caused the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Again, what are we saying here? <coughs> Jesus is performing miracles for Gentiles. He's treating them just as he treated Jews. Now is he doing this because it was prophesied that the Messiah would do these things, so he's doing these so to prove that he is the Messiah, or is he doing this because he has compassion? In, I, I mean, in the Old Testament, where it predicts the Messiah is coming, yeah. 
and predicts that he will do these things, mm -hmm. is it because <clears throat> he's a Messiah of God compassion? is like that. Right, yeah. yeah. Let me just add these few words from Ellen White, the book Acts of the Apostles, page 19, paragraph 3. Still more plainly was it revealed on the occasion of his visit to Phoenicia. Now that's the Tyre and Sidon visit, when he healed the daughter of the Canaanite woman. These experiences helped the disciples to understand that among those whom many regarded as unworthy of salvation, there were souls hungering for the light of truth. So well, I, I seems, think that's an important... It seems obvious that this played a part later on when Jesus was gone, when they had the big argument, mm -hmm. you know, about Gentiles versus Jews. You know, I'm sure that that got brought up. Mm -hmm. He was never around J the Jewish eras all the time. He went out to the Gentiles also, so th they had to have bring that up. I mean, okay. that's just so obvious. Let's, yeah. Why did Jesus tell the people not to tell anyone? In the past, we've heard it said, well, we've said, don't tell people because you're going to the priest and the priest will be prejudiced if he hears that you were healed by Jesus or you know, I don't want to stir up trouble with the with the Jewish authorities mm -hmm. who were already trying to persecute Jesus. Why in this Gentile territory does Jesus tell these people not to tell anyone about the miracles? Okay, now let's think about what we're saying here. Jesus is setting aside six months for special training for his disciples. Does he want to be hounded day and night by huge crowds? No. He's trying to avoid crowds. But even in, uh, on the reason that you, that you mentioned, he's only eight, about eight miles from Judean territory across yeah. the lake. Yeah. And if they, they, they could get across there pretty easy it's, if they wanted did. to make troubles. Yeah. Some did, I'm sure. Another interesting point, none of us have any question about how he healed this deaf mute man, guy, right? I mean, it was whose power that did that? God's, God's, God's power. power. But notice what it says. Jesus, unusual techniques. <laughs> Jesus took him off alone, away from the crowd, put his fingers in the man's ears, spat, and touched the man's tongue. What was the purpose of that? Well, it's custom those days. Wasn't that something with saliva? Well, the ancients did believe that there was healing properties in, in spit. In spit, yes. Don't saliva. you think there's, there's some communication value to the people watching around when he points to the ears and touches the tongue, and then, then those objects get healed? Well, that would be fine, except Jesus took him off alone, it says, just specifically. Well, then how come we know about this? You know, this guy spilled the beans. <laughs> he, he couldn't. The beans. Jesus, Jesus couldn't, get, get, couldn't keep him quiet. Well, maybe that's part of your answer to the other question. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just proving that nobody can be kept quiet. Mm -hmm you know, about something like that that happened. I mean, what, what would you do if, if you had just been healed? You've been deaf-mute for your entire life, and all of a sudden six, someone sticks his hands in, his fingers in his ear, his ears, and touches your tongue, and now you can speak and hear completely normally. Would you say, well, I, I sure wouldn't want to tell anybody what happened. I'm not going to go around and say anything now that I can speak. <laughs> no. <laughs> would there have been some reverse psychology here? Christ knew what was going to happen. The more you tell him not to, they're going to say more. Yeah. And it gets even further afield of what he said. Yeah, Possible. Because it, it almost comes across like Jesus didn't know what he was doing by telling them not to, yeah. to go talk. And they did anyway. Well, he, he knows what they're going to do. So anyway, back to the touching of the tongue. And, yeah. and the, was that a, maybe he was communicating to the man. He couldn't hear. Maybe he, the man didn't know what he was doing. So he Possibly. pointed to the ears. And then he touched the man's tongue, so he was communicating to the man, look, I'm going to fix your hearing so you can talk, and you'll be able to talk too. Quite possible. As good as any other reason I've heard. You're not supposed to shove, shrug your sposers. You're supposed to say that's exactly <laughs> what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that was exactly what... <laughs> Since you're supported by the Bible, I guess it would be fair to say that. <laughs> Okay, well, <laughs> let, let's, let's, let's notice what happens next. The next passage we come to chronologically is um, Matthew 15, starting verse thir 32. Matthew 15, starting verse 32. 
Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel, now, oh, let me explain what happened. And it'll say, that, well, let me, go, let me read the verse and then you'll understand. Because they have been with me for three days and now have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away without feeding them, for they might faint on their way home. Now, here we have, it, we're going to find out in a moment, there were 4,000 men, not counting women and children. And these are not Jews, they're Gentiles, primarily. Now, there, I'm sure there were some Jews, but it, this was Gentile territory. And Jews didn't just sort of wander around in Gentile ter just territory just wondering what to do. Some of them lived over there, but the majority of Jews did not live there. Furthermore, how was it that all of us... And Jesus is now in a remote area because he's, he's trying to teach his disciples. This isn't the idea of, well, let me grab a lot of crowds. No, he's trying to be in a remote area, teach his disciples. And suddenly, this, the people find out he's there, and their crowds swarm out to this desert area to see him. Why, why was that? Sheep go where they get fed. Okay, but there's a specific reason why when Jesus came to this area, suddenly there was an intense oh, interest. The demoniac. Yeah. This was the area where the demoniac, or possibly two, as Matthew suggests, yeah. these demon-possessed men had been cast, had been, their de devils had been cast out and into the pigs, and they'd gone to the lake, uh, Sea of Galilee. And Jesus said, go home and tell your family. And now Jesus is coming back, and what happens? Everybody wants to see him. And the, and the people who wanted to see him were the ones who told him to go away yes. right after he had, had uh, ruined their income. Yeah. So go, reading on, verse 33, the disciples asked him, where will we find enough food in this desert to feed this crowd? So it's clearly this is not in a town. And they've been with him for three days. Now, have, now is this the first time he has fed people? No, he, he's fed so 5,000 Jews. Why are they asking this question again? Well, but you see, these people are Gentiles. They don't deserve to be fed. Those other people were Jews. But, but the question wasn't, <laughs> why are you feeding these people? The question is, where are we going to get bread to do it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was they already asked that question. Yeah, <laughs> they, they've had that answered before. Yeah, exactly. Well, How, just, the attorney sure. says, asked and answered. Yes. yes. How I much bread do you have, Jesus asked, yes? I think it just shows another, another reason why demonstration doesn't really do anything for you. It doesn't really remember the demonstration, well, especially when the... No, the no, 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 no. I, I would disagree with you. But what it <laughs> does show is that when you have prejudice, even when something is demonstrated very openly, your prejudice will sort of, if possible, kind of erase it from your brain. Okay, you use the word prejudice. Where do you get that from? Other than Because these are now Jewish. Gentiles, and those other ones were Jews. <sighs> but... Still, you, you, can't, you, you can't, you can't pretend together. that you know about the New Testament and not know about the prejudice. Well, I know prejudices, but I'm still thinking, why that same answer? Why the same answer? Would prejudice make their brains go away as far yes, as figuring it does. out? The answer, it is, the answer is yes. I, I just don't understand that. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> it, it may not be a good thing, but it's true. Yeah. So they said, we found seven loaves and a few f small fish. So Jesus ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground, and they took up the seven loaves and the fish, gave thanks to God, broke them, and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and had enough. Then the disciples took up seven baskets full of pieces left over. The number of men who ate was 4,000, not counting women and children. Then Jesus sent the people away, got into a boat, and went to the territory of Magadan. Now this is bread and fish again? Yes. No baskets this time. So maybe oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They all ate and had enough. The, the disciples took up seven baskets full of pieces left over. Seven. seven. The other one was, was twelve. Which means that whoever provided the few loaves and fishes never dreamed of taking home seconds. That's <laughs> a fair quantity. Yeah, exactly. Well, and if you, if you look at the Greek, the baskets that were used in the feeding of the 5,000 were smaller Jewish baskets. You come to these, and these are larger Gentile baskets. So it's very clearly, that was Jewish, this is Gentile. Interesting that they, that they always give you the number of baskets left over. Yeah. yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, what do you think happened to what was left over? People took it home. Yeah. 
And then of course, and they and said, taste some of this, and let me tell you what happened. Try some of this, let me tell you what happened. About the difference between the 4,000 and 5,000, it also speaks it directly about it a uh, few verses forward in exactly. 16, mm -hmm. 9 and 10, I think it is. Yeah. Saying that it's two different episodes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although a lot of modern scholars try to pretend like it's only a single episode. You know, uh, we, we mentioned the prejudice here and um, that the Jews would not even, you know, they, they would go clear around Samaria, for example, rather than yep. the, a good Jew. So if there were Jews living among these Gentiles, then they must not be very good Jews. Is it possible that, that and I'm not saying all, of the Jews here, but is it possible that many of the Jews that lived here were, were kind of considered by their brothers and maybe even by themselves as kind of black sheep? Quite possible. And so when the Messiah that even the black sheep Jewish had, had known about all their, all their lives shows up on their doorstep here. Uh, maybe he's gone not only after the Gentiles, but after these black sheep. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I kind of, I wonder about this prejudice that everybody's talking about, which I know was there, but um, what do you think the disciples were thinking when Jesus was walking through all those places, all these places? It wasn't their idea stuff? to go there. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true, but still they did and they followed him. Well, the, the reason, let me tell you why I think the, the prejudice was so incredible. Look at it. Acts 11. Now we're talking about years later, okay? Years later. Now past the stoning of Stephen, you know, and finally Christians start scattering out of, around, from around Jerusalem because they're being terribly persecuted. They're scattering. And even so, if you look at Acts 11, verse 19, some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, we've just been talking about, Cyprus and Antioch telling the message to Jews only. Even years later, three and a half years after Jesus was crucified, they're still, they, they're traveling out to these territories, but who are they speaking to? Jews only. You go back just one verse from that, yeah. and it says, you know, the conclusion after, after Peter's talking about uh, Cornelius, mm -hmm. then God has, uh, they said, then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live. Yeah. And yet, they didn't put that into practice. Yeah. You know, you know, Ken, I think the situation is one of the reasons Gary is struggling with in here as he's expressing this, is that when we read this as Christians long after the fact and have an understanding of what Jesus mm -hmm. is all about and the good disciples and so forth, um, we forget that they were clueless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the next thing that happens is that Jesus ventures back to Jewish territory. And after, I mean, we don't know for sure how long it took him to walk way out there to Sidon and then all the way back and feeding the 4,000 the 4, here, etc. How long it took. But he went down on the, on the far side of the Sea of Galilee, crossed over by boat into Jewish territory, and what happened next? Well, we'll talk about it when we come back. Don't go away.
Thank you for staying by. We mentioned that there were some very interesting things that happened when Jesus and his disciples crossed by boat back into Galilean and Jewish territory. And that story is found in Matthew 16, starting with verse 1. Some Pharisees and Sadducees who came to Jesus wanted to trap him, so they asked him to perform a miracle for them to show that God approved of him. So here Jesus has been traveling in the Gentile territory. Crowds have been coming out to see him and to hear him, and they're blessed by his ministry, etc. And, it, you know, it looks like things are going great. And he barely steps his foot back inside of Galilean and Jewish territory, and immediately the Pharisees and scribes or, or the Sadducees are pouncing on him to try to, 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 to trap him. What is Jesus' response? Jesus' response was, when the sun is setting, you say we are going to have fine weather because the sky is red. And early in the morning, you say it's going to rain because the sky is red and dark. You can predict the weather by looking at the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs concerning these times. How evil and godless are the people of this day. You ask, for, ask me for a miracle? No. The only miracle you will be given is the miracle of Jonah. So he left them and went away. And where did he go? Back across the lake. And so what so, is the miracle of Jonah? The miracle of Jonah is he went and evangelized and people listened to him and they go all Three days converted. and three nights. No. Oh. <laughs> Both, maybe. Two parts of the Jonah story. Well, so here we have this situation. He touches down on Jewish territory and man, there's a huge uprising. Get this guy out of here. He crosses back over the lake. What is Jesus trying to say when he says, you know, you can predict the weather, but you can't, can't notice the signs of the times. What do you think he's trying to say? Well, it's another version of, you read the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but you don't get it because they talk of me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. They, 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 they knew, I mean, they, they knew very well that when, if they had left Jesus alone, he, multitudes would be flocking after him, and, and the whole place would be converted. But what are they doing? They're fighting against the facts, which is really the bottom line. Well, the question is, how often does this happen, where you have a man walking around, speaking about God, doing all these miracles, kind of turning everything upside down, and yet they, they don't think it's from God? Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think I think there were a lot of uh, a lot of purported messiahs walking around claiming to be messiah. Yeah, I don't, but I don't, I don't think, think if they were healing, you know. No. I don't even think they were gathering that many people around. It was probably a miracle that the the Romans didn't get upset with all these people congregating around him all the time. Mm -hmm. You know. It was, well, <clears throat> we've just talked about the fact that Jesus had taken his disciples way off to the northwest, way up into the territory of Tyre and apparently all the way to Sidon. And then he'd come back, traveling across north of the Sea of Galilee and staying in Gentile territory, preaching to people, he performing healing miracles, etc. He crosses the Gal Sea of Galilee and bang, they jump on him. So he just goes back across the Sea of Galilee and then he turns around this time. Instead, he goes almost straight north up to Caesarea Philippi. And that story is a very, very significant one. It's found in Matthew 16. I'm going to start reading from verse 13. Now, what kind of territory is this? Is this Gentile territory? Yes, this, is, this is Gentile territory, yes. So he came back home and it's wasn't received. Not received at all. And so he left. Went back to Gentile territory. Yeah. And, I mean, I mean, I, you know, it just seems so obvious to me, and maybe, maybe someone else has a different picture of this, but I think he's trying to teach his disciples. You know, they don't want us in Jewish territory. The Jews are trying to kill me. Can, don't you, can't you figure that out? Now, this, I mean, he's, he's not rejecting all Jews. There were a lot of Jews who were, who were doing uh, very wonderful things, and the Jews were his disciples, etc. But they, they took, crossed back over into Gentile territory, and no problem. But the disciples would have been more than happy to have him perform that miracle for the Pharisees. Oh, yeah. They'd have loved that. We're, we're getting close to where we want to be when they do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If and they were all kind of 
waiting for him to become a general. Yeah, so that, and uh, a king. And a king, so. Well, look at what happens next. Jesus went to the territory near the town of Caesarea Philippi, where he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, you need to understand a little bit about their language. When Jesus says Son of Man, what is, what's he implying? Referring to himself. He's human. He's human. He's hum the, the expression, they, don't have, they didn't have words like human being, I mean, that kind of thing. They would say Son of Man. In other words, if you're a son of something, then presumably you're of the same essence as that thing is. So Jesus is saying, who do people say this human being is? That's what he's asking. And some say John the Baptist, they answered. Others say Elijah, while others say Jeremiah, some other prophet. So let's think about this for a moment. Why would they say John the Baptist? John the Baptist has been killed. John the Baptist has been killed. He was killed just just shortly before Jesus and his disciples had left Galilee and traveled to Tyre and Sidon. So just maybe two or three months before this, John the Baptist has been killed. So they think maybe he got resurrected and this is coming back again. Okay, let's look at some next one. They answered, others say Elijah. Why would some say Elijah? Because of prophecy. He's what prophecy? Elijah was predicted to, to return. Yeah, Malachi. Let me read Malachi chapter 4. If you've got your Bible, it's like the last uh, two verses. Or the la no, it's the last, hold on here, the last two verses of Malachi. But the, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, I will send you the prophet Elijah. He will bring fathers and children together again. Otherwise, they would have to come and destroy your country. So this had been prophesied. So p some people are saying, well, maybe this is Elijah. And of course, Elijah was taken to heaven without dying. Yes. They knew that story. Mm -hmm. So he exactly. could come again. While others say Jeremiah, why would some say Jeremiah? That was a prophet they could name. Yes, well, <laughs> 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 not quite that simple. There, there are some passages in Jeremiah that suggest that Jeremiah might be the prophet of the end of time and so forth. He might be the prophet that, that would come back. And so that they, and then some say, and, or some other prophet. What other prophet might they, might they be talking about? A new prophet? Hmm? A new prophet? Yeah, but uh, specifically like somebody in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Remember? Moses said, God someday will send a prophet like me. So there's another possibility. So they had searched the scriptures. And you can be sure that the people who were followers of Jesus and all the ones who had observed him and knew what his powers were said, you know, he's got to be the fulfillment of something in the Old Testament. You know, just has to be. Okay. And then Jesus says, what about you? He asked them, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter gives that fantastic answer. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, let's apply our rule once again. When you say Messiah, the, what's the, Messiah is a Hebrew word. What's the Greek word? Christ. Christ. Which means anointed. Means the anointed one. So you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. What does Son of the living God mean? You're divine. Not human. You're, you're divine. Now, all that's fine. Where did Jesus, where did Peter get that information? Jesus told him. The Spirit. The Spirit. Read on. <laughs> Good for you, Simon, son of John, answered Jesus. For this truth did not come to you from any human being. Now, remember, I'm the human being, he says. <coughs> um, but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock. That's a Petros in, in Greek. And on this rock foundation, that's Petra, uh, I will build my church and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell, tell anyone that he was the Messiah, that he was the Christ, that he was the anointed one. Now, you may be familiar 
I hope you are, with Christian history enough to know that this verse is the verse that Roman Catholics claim as their key to the fact that the keys of the kingdom were handed to Peter and he has handed them to every down from Pope to Pope from that day until this. Does that mean that, and they would say that that means that you cannot be saved unless you're a Roman, or you've been baptized as a Roman Catholic. Are there any scriptural evidence that that might, other scriptural evidence that that might be true or perhaps not true? Well, there's Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Okay, you want to read that for us? You got it handy? Now is the question whether whether you can't be healed or you can't be saved unless you're baptized into that particular religious organization well, well, or yeah. is it the question uh, have these keys really been handed down through uh, uh, both they're together if if they were in effect handed to Peter and he handed to everyone then that would be some validity to the argument wouldn't it <coughs> yes so Ephesians 2:19 so then, you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now citizens together with God's people and members of the family of God. You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. And if you look at one of the more traditional translations, it will not say laid by the apostles and prophets, it says the foundation which is the apostles and the prophets. So. There, Paul says that the, 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 the apostles and the prophets are the foundation, but Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Says that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting to notice if you, if you face a Roman Catholic and he brings this point up, you should ask him about Matthew 18, verse 18, which says, And so I tell all of you, what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So apparently Jesus, a few little while later, hands these keys to all of the disciples. Peter himself says over his God, in his letters that Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone. So I, I don't think that uh, it's valid to say that only Catholics will be saved. And on, on an infallibility issue, mm -hmm. Paul himself had issues with Peter. So if you're looking for someone who's infallible, if, if your leader must be infallible, mm -hmm. it's not Peter. Yeah. Galatians 2. But isn't there, I'm not negating that, but doesn't the word Peter, I'm no biblical language expert, but it means a pebble or a rock. Yeah. Petros Christ is, is a, saying there, yeah. I'm the cornerstone. You don't build a church on a That's foundation right. of pebbles. Yeah. Right there, it shoots <laughs> it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you put it that way. Please. Petros is a small stone, something right. you can pick right. up and throw. Petra is a large, like a foundation exactly. stone, a large, yeah. big, heavy stone. Yeah. So right there. There is that difference. Yeah. But m not everybody who is from is familiar with the Greek, and so that may not be the very best argument. But yeah. perhaps a, a, another very good argument is what the verses that immediately follow. Notice what happens back in Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to say plainly to his disciples, what does that suggest to you? Not Jesus began to say what? He's not talking in parables. Not talking in parables. He's not using difficult language. He began to say plainly to his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer much from the elders, the chief priests, <coughs> and the teachers of the law. I will be put to death, but three days later I will be raised to life. Now, are there any words that are, that are, that are long and complicated and hard to understand? <laughs> No, and Peter understood him. He, Peter understood him completely. He said, Lord, you can't talk that way. Yeah, Peter <laughs> took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid it, Lord. He said, that must never happen to you. I mean, how can our king be crucified, right? Now, where is this happening? This is, in Philippi? this is Caesarea Philippi, it's way up territory. Gentile territory, and it was, a, it was a center for pagan worship. There were all kinds of, I and mean, you, you can go there even now and find caves and other things with, with bits and pieces left of pagan worship. Maybe it's easier to understand this when it's mentioned in, a, in, a, uh, in an environment which is uh, totally uh, unadulterated with 
your the surroundings of the improper philosophies of your own culture. Boy, pretty scary, that? huh? Pretty scary. I mean, Peter was just basically saying, Lord, I don't believe you. Yeah. And, and the question is, how could just a few moments before he make this proclamation, and it turns out that he didn't really believe, I mean, the proclamation Peter makes like Jesus said, this is from the Father. I mean, it's wonderful that you said that. None of you, I'm sure Jesus could have turned around and looked at all of them and said, not one of you here really understands what Peter just said. Yeah. I like what the New American Standard says. You're, uh, you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus turned around and said to Peter, get away from me, Satan. Now, what does that say about the infallibility of Peter? <laughs> huh? <laughs> You're an obstacle in my way because these thoughts of yours don't come from God but from human nature. So right up there, my Father has given you these thoughts, but now these are not from God for sure. You know, they're from human nature. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you want to come with me, you must forget yourselves, carry your cross. Suddenly he's talking about strange things and follow me. For if you want to save your li own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. Will you gain anything if you win the whole world but lose your life? Of course not. There's nothing you can give to regain your life. For the Son of Man, there's Jesus calling himself a human being again, is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he will reward each one according to his deeds. I assure you that there are some here who will not die until they have seen the Son of Man come as King. What does that mean? What does yeah. that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, we have to do a little exploring. Look at, uh, we go now to Mark 9, 30, verse 30. Mark What's 9. the next verse in Matthew that yeah. follows that? It's the Transfiguration. Six days later, I, and it's fair to say that, even though some other, few other things happened in between. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and the brothers James and John and led them up a high mountain where they were alone. And of course, we're, we'll come back to this in a moment. He was transfigured. They saw Jesus in his divine glory. Six days later. So I'm sure that's what Matthew was referring to here. So, but we need to go first to, to uh, Mark 9. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. We skipped over one thing I, want, I, I did want to talk to, and that's uh, Mark 8, starting verse 22. Once again, now, he's, he's still in Gentile territory, but he's close to Bethsaida, very close to Jewish territory, where some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. After spitting on the man's eyes, here we have our spit again, Spitting on the man's eyes, Jesus placed his hands on him and asked him, Can you see anything? The man looked up and said, Yes, I can see people, but they look like trees walking around. Jesus again placed his hands on the man's eyes. This time the man looked intently. His eyesight returned and he saw everything clearly. Jesus then sent him home with an order, Don't go back into the village. What would that be? Why would he say that? And, and some manuscripts had, and don't say anything to anybody. Well, he took him out of the village yeah. to perform the miracle. Mm -hmm. Now he's telling him, don't go back into the village. Go and, home. And what about don't? Yeah, yeah. And what about this? He didn't get the job done right the first time. Yeah. Why a two-stage healing? <laughs> mm -hmm. Anybody have an idea what that would be? Maybe he was tired. <laughs> maybe he was developing maybe. some faith in the... Yeah, yeah, maybe the blind man didn't quite have a clear picture yet. Well, that's what kind of happens with everybody, isn't it? When, mm -hmm. when they first become converted, it takes a while. Yeah. So things become completely mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. If they ever do, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully they do. Seems that. like every healing that Jesus did, he said, your faith has healed you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe encouraging this man's faith mm -hmm. to come along, he can see a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you, your faith is growing, let's do it again. Let's see what happens now. Mm -hmm. So now did Jesus seek this man out as he did the, the lady in Tyre and Sidon? Possible. 
very possible. Now he's close on Jewish territory, so we can't know for sure whether this might have been a Jew who went outside of Jewish territory to find Jesus, but it may have been a Gentile. We just don't know. Yeah. So about this half healing first, Jesus, some have suggested that this is, well, Jesus messed up. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's more of what you said, that he's building the faith in this man, saying, this is what I've done. It's not just the snap of my fingers yeah. or something. This is the healing process. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that, that that's, it's more along that line. Yeah, exactly. Well, if that were true, it was a good thing he asked him, what do you see? Because he could have walked off and not finished, right? Mm, he probably knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, we go next, as I said, to Mark 9, starting with verse 30. <coughs> and here we find some interesting words. Jesus and his disciples left that place and went on through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where he was. So now he's gone through Galilee, but this time, how, what, in what, what kind of form was he traveling through Galilee? Secretly. Very secretly, hiding inside buildings and so forth, because he was teaching his disciples. What's the, what's the clue there? He wants to spend this time with his disciples. The Son of Man will be handed over to those who will kill him. Three days later, however, he will rise to life. But they did not understand what this teaching meant, and they were afraid to ask him. I wouldn't blame him. Peter did, and look what happened to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. But now this is, a lot of people identify this as Jesus is first speaking about his uh, death. This is actually the second, isn't it? The second speaking about his, his death. You know, I think this passage would, would better have said that they didn't understand completely mm -hmm. what Jesus was talking about, mm -hmm. but they could see it was something that, they, that didn't look too good, and that's why they were afraid to ask. But he didn't say that, you know, one of these days, I don't think you can find it any place in the gospel, one of these days I'm going to pay the penalty for your sins, and you're all going to be paid up and uh, have a free pass or get out of jail free card. Mm -hmm. It isn't in there. But he was teaching how to live, and that's, that's what he's always done, and it, does, it takes time to do that. Even the angels in heaven had things they had to learn. So when well, he was walking around kind of hiding, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily he was hiding from his enemies. He was probably hiding from everybody else, yeah. too, because they would have took all his time, and he would have had nothing left for the disciples. Yeah, no, that, I think that's probably true. Look quickly at, at Matthew 18. We're going to go next to Matthew 18, starting with verse 1. Um, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus asking, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So Jesus called a child to come and stand in front of them and said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like this child. And whoever welcomes him in my name, one such a child as this, welcomes me. So what was Jesus trying to tell us about being a child? Teachable. Yeah. Teachable? Okay. A child has, uh, certainly if they will, even if they have bad parents, mm -hmm. they have a tendency to have great faith and trust mm -hmm. in their parents. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very true. Maybe the most important thing about a child is its capacity to grow. You know, if a child fails to grow physically, we become alarmed. If he fails to grow uh, mentally, we become very, very alarmed. But if he fails to grow spiritually, are we supposed to say, that's wonderful, that's nice, oh, isn't that wonderful? And of course, if you look at, at Hebrews 11, I'm sorry, Hebrews 5, starting with verse 11, or if you look at Ephesians 4, starting with verse 13, there's a great deal of talk about growing up and being ready for the difficult times that are coming. So how does that fit with this passage in Matthew 18? How can you be a child and be grown up at the same time? They have some childlike traits. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, isn't Jesus saying every one of us needs to retain that capacity to, to listen and learn and to grow? 
uh, you know, there's chill. No, no pretense in children, mm -hmm. young children. Yeah. Well, it's a process that continues. I mean, if you're grown up, well, then you don't grow anymore. Yeah. But you don't have to. You don't have to stop growing spiritually. We should keep growing spiritually. In fact, someone has suggested that if you're worshiping exactly the same picture of God that you're worshiping two years ago or even last year, you're worshiping a graven image. Think about that. You have an idol. It's like an idol. Yeah. So, Ken, we're nearing the end of this session. What have we learned about God through this portion of the Gospels? I think we've learned several things. One, Jesus recognized that these disciples that he's now spending so much time with are going to be the nucleus of his new church. And they need to be solidly grounded in the truth. But as we just mentioned, it's really difficult for him to teach them. Prejudice must be a factor. Poor education, wrong education must be a factor. We don't know what all the factors were. But, I mean, Jesus himself, who must, must be the greatest teacher who ever lived, uh, and we're going to read, oh, when we get to Luke 18, we're going to say they're on their way from Jericho to Jerusalem on their very last journey. I mean, it's, it's a few days before Jesus is going to be crucified, and they still don't know what in the world he's talking about when he talks about going up to Jerusalem and being crucified, and he's talked about it four times that we have recorded. We don't know how many other times there were. I mean, why would it be so difficult for a group of adult men to sort of get it? And, I mean, and not, not counting the women, maybe the women got it, and we just don't, aren't, talk, aren't told about them. Thank you for smiling, Myra. That was nice. <laughs> so, so we don't know what, what all was going on, but clearly Jesus thought it was necessary for him to spend some very special time with his disciples because he knew what was coming. Their, their faith was going to be tested and tried like they couldn't believe. And Jesus wanted to prepare them for that. And that time is getting to be very near. It's coming very close. We're down to almost down to the last six months in Jesus' life. So we'll talk about that next week. Make sure you're there.